Pony, welcome back to Pony Talk. Well, to wrap up my season five videos, I'm going to talk about my favorite episode from last season, and maybe my favorite episode of the entire series. It feels a little cheap to call it my favorite episode so far, but it's definitely tied for a number one position. That, of course, being the hundredth episode, Slice of Life. And yeah, hundred episodes. Whoever thought this show would get that far? I mean, that's a milestone for any show, especially a kids' cartoon based on a toy, and a little girl's toy at that. Traditionally, those things haven't lasted long, but as we can tell, this show has blown away all sorts of expectations. Well, let's not waste any more time and get right into the action. Or, as action-y as misprinting wedding invitations can be, I mean, a whole day off. Wow, Cranky, I guess cheaping out on the printing press wasn't such a bright idea, was it? Hello. Blah! Who are you? Bright idea. How did you get in here? Oh, I just appear when ponies mention my name. Weird. But since you're here, you want to do a quick collab? What are you talking about? Slice of Life, the 100th episode. Oh, well, I already made a highlights video about that episode, so thanks, but no thanks. I got other things to do on my channel. Aw, oh well, maybe we can do something later some other time. Yeah, well, I better get going. See ya! Well, that was odd. But a perfect segue into the Featherweight cameo. Though, seriously, who would let a child operate a printing press? I told Cranky I could get him printed for cheap, but that meant hiring some pony with no experience using a printing press. Ah, that makes sense. But I do like this characterization for Ditsy. And yes, I call her Ditsy Do. I really don't see what's wrong with that name. It takes elements of the Fanon personality and what we saw in the canon last time she got to appear and speak, and kind of adds to it. She's happy, bubbly, a little, well, ditzy, but also trying to help fix the problem she created. It shows she's aware of the screw-up she makes and does everything in her power to correct them. It's very admirable. And while I didn't have a problem with her original voice in the last roundup, I think this latest voice is just perfect for her. So again, kudos goes to Tabitha St. Germain for being able to come up with one of a thousand different voices. Especially for making one so cute. And of course, this scene leads into the scene with Doctor Who's, which I already touched upon when I put forth my theory about the castle here. But I do have to say this. Like most people, I watch the show on YouTube because I didn't have the Hub or Discovery Family and don't have cable at all now. And when I found this app, this was the thumbnail. I thought that was a troll video. I felt there was no way they were actually going to do that. And then holy crap, they actually did that. And it was glorious and led to a thing I didn't know I want until it happened. The Doctor meeting the dude. Okay, it's Pony stand-in version, but come on, this is what would happen if those two ever met. And this scene has a bit of a hilarious in hindsight moment given what happened in Season 8 of Doctor Who. Me. What an unfortunate name. Yep, really unfortunate now, ain't it, Doc? Also, another thing they brought up that I really never would have thought of. What's this word you keep using, man? Yeah, that is a weird thing for him to say, isn't it? Then we move from a weird line to probably one of the best lines. Maybe it's just a friendship problem, and it'll all be cleared up in a half an hour or so. <laughs> Great bit of fourth wall leaning, and that's about the time Sweetie Belle became my favorite CMC. Also, that scene does technically have the first time Octavia spoke in canon. And also, Button Mash came back. Yay! I do love how the residents of Ponyville have gotten so used to these monster attacks, they just kind of shrug them off and still go about their day. Like, you know, still help set up a wedding, like our favorite best friends are doing. Yeah, another scene I've talked about earlier and, and plan to talk about again, but for right now, I want to focus on the best part of it. Did you say Bugbear? It found me! What are you talking about, Bonbon? Bon? My name isn't Bonbon. Bon. It's Special Agent Sweetie Drops. I work for a super-secret anti-monster agency in Canterlot. Or at least I did until the bugbear went missing from Tartarus a few years back. What are you talking about? 
When it escaped, we had to shutter the whole agency. Every last shred of evidence of the organization's existence was destroyed. Celestia demanded complete deniability. What? It was me who captured the bugbear. I had to go deep cover here in Ponyville and assume the name Bonbon. Bon. I never thought it'd be able to track me, but now it has. Are you saying our whole friendship was based on a lie? I know there are some who don't like that scene because just how out of nowhere it is, but that's exactly why I love it. It's so unexpected and so over the top, it just hits me right in that sweet spot. Plus, it gave Bon Bon a thing. Think about it. In all the fan art and fanfics with the background six there, Bon Bon was always just kind of Bon Bon. All the others got to have their little quirks and personalities or be the doctor, but she was always straight mare. And while I suppose that worked when you put her against Lyra's a little more eccentric personality, it really made her boring. But now she's anything but boring. Plus, part of me really likes the fact that they did flip fandom expectation on his head. If nothing else, it was a clever way to work in both of her names. And, of course, now we're on fan theory, that's why her voice is always different. Which works as well as anything else. And then we jump from one scene I've talked about before to another scene I've talked about before, the vinyl Octavia scene. Okay, yeah, I know in between that there's the scene with Stephen Magnet and Matilda, but that didn't really add much, other than confirm that his name is indeed Stephen Magnet. Well, that and he's Cranky's best friend and not really good at helping with wedding jitters. So yes, that happened. Now back to vinyl Octavia. Again, I don't want to go into it too much since I've already talked about this scene and played the awesome music montage, but I do just want to bring up this house. I friggin' love the design of their house. To me, it shows off perfectly their dynamic. Two wildly different styles that somehow come together to form a cohesive whole. And whether you want to see them as mare friends or best friends, it's still a perfect visual representation of them both. And then we get the audio representation of that with the dubstep cello mashup. Which, again, I've already played a couple times, so I won't play it again. <laughs> but I will play the ensuing chaos that happens when they try to rush their way to the wedding. Especially since, while I love the music in the episode itself, I think I found something that's just a little bit more fitting. Kinda scary how well that works, right? And of course it ended with the second best surprise of the episode, Deep Thinker Gummy. Again, was any pony expecting that to happen? This is sure no, I wasn't, but I love it. I love it every time I watch it, and it still makes me laugh. And naturally make me wonder what he's been thinking through the rest of the series up till now. I mean... Before this, I always just assume Pinky was being Pinky and assigning things to uh, his blank stares. But now we know he really is thinking some pretty deep philosophical thoughts about life, the universe, and everything. And I now do have to wonder if Pinky is somehow picking up on this. She is Pinky after all, and I can see her Pinky since playing in that somehow. Or maybe there's another explanation. She's psychic! You would know, wouldn't you? And, of course, we can't forget about that hidden frame the production crew slipped into the madness there. Wait, that's not right. Anyway, where are we now? Oh, right, we made it to the wedding. I do love how surprised every pony looks there. I think Minuet's thinking she picked the wrong day to visit Ponyville. And among all of the guests are Celestia and Luna, and I really would like to know the story of how Cranky and or Matilda met them. 
But more importantly is this totally sister squabbling moment they have. As others have pointed out, we need more of this in the show. We want a full episode like this. I do just have to say one thing, though. These two are the rulers of Equestria, the controllers of the sun and the moon. They've lived for, let's say, at least a couple thousand years. And they both go in on one present? I mean, they have to have access to some kind of treasury Equestria has, right? And yet they're cheaping out! For shame, ladies! Honestly, I half expected them to write their names down on the present Spike puts on the table. I guess that would have been too much, huh? Speaking of guests with stories, really want to know how Matilda knows that change lane. Yeah, it was confirmed that Matilda invited him and that his name is Kevin, which <laughs> amuses me. Still, though, what is your deal, Kevin? What is your deal? On the note of wedding guests and stories, it seems the event of the Big Lebowski really did play out in the Pony version, too. I mean, look at Pony Dude and Walter, and look who's missing. And then you see that Pony Walter's holding a coffee can. Full disclosure, I didn't notice that until I saw it on Equestria Daily, but now I can't unsee it. That happened quickly, and shows that these guys go full on with their references. Oh, which reminds me... Great wickering stallions! Look at the time! We'd better get inside. Allons-y! <laughs> he said the thing, and he's wearing the scarf! I ah, love this show so much. And I especially love this little bit here. Oh, Seth Mayer! Now who's the background ponies? And then there's the wedding and reception with a great speech by Mayor Mayer, but I'm already running long on this, so I feel I should wrap it up. And as I said at the top, I friggin' love this episode. Maybe it's not perfect, but I love what it represents. And that is a love letter to us, the fans. Both the expected ones, and the completely unexpected ones, the bronies. There have been so many that have called this episode a pandering episode, and that's why the bugbear is part panda, but that's just... Way too cynical. Why do we have to look at it like that? Again, the show isn't cynical, so why do we have to be? Why can't this just be a thank you letter from from Hasbro, from DHX, from all the writers, directors, voice actors, animators, everyone involved on this wonderful show? Why can't we just sit back and enjoy it for the crazy fun it was meant to be? That's exactly why I love it, and like I said, it's definitely one of my top-tier episodes of the series. And the absolute furthest I've seen any company go to thank their fans. So to everyone who was involved in this episode, I say in return, thank you from the bottom of my heart. And that wraps up my look at Season 5. There are a couple things I want to come back to later, but for now... I want to get back on track to just other topics I'm mean, mean to talk about. Like, why are unicorns such jerks? Join me next time when I examine that question. Until then, I am Birdie, and I'll see you again for more Pony Talk. Yeah,